So phenomenal is an initiative we, we, we developed very recently, like, uh, but uh, we, it was in the making for a few years. And simply put, it's a, it's a website. It's a website that uh, um, home, is a home for uh, resources for science teachers and science educators in general. So um, the concept is very simple. As a, as a teacher, you can uh, log in and you can download materials that you can use. That, now there's a lot of research, especially in Argentina, that points to the fact that uh, you can actually improve a lot the quality of the education that students receive if you make resources available. That one of the limiting factors now is not so much Training of teachers, actually training in Argentina for the teachers is really costly in so many variables. I'm not gonna begin with that, uh, but that if you give them good examples and good resources, then um, the quality of the education that students receive can improve dramatically. So we developed this, the, this website precisely to do that. And um, very briefly, the, uh, the thing is downloadable. You can, you can navigate, you can download things that you can use in your classroom. It's for both primary school and secondary school. Um, the materials are absolutely free and you can copy them, you can change them. In fact, they are uh, under a Creative Commons uh, license, uh, uh, share alike. Uh, so you can basically transform this uh, further. It is, we'll see further that it's centered on students role. It's not simply an, an expository uh, uh, type of teaching. It's um, more of a participatory you know, teaching. Um, all the materials are reviewed by scientists. And it's a key thing that I'm gonna go back to uh, later. Um, and in the future, we hope that this venue will become basically like a peer review journal where uh, teachers, not scientists, teachers can publish their productions and share them with others. Because we, we detect that there's a ton of teachers that have great material, but they never share because they have no incentive to do so. So we're trying to create those incentives to give them authorship so that they can brag about it the, the way scientists do uh, and, 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 and get some credit for the fantastic job they're doing. So the basic idea actually, uh, let me see if I can uh, show you a little bit of the um, website itself. Um, can you see that? Can you see the website? Okay, great. So um, this is our homepage, and as you can see, uh, all the material is organized in what we call sequencias didácticas. Uh, that's uh, bundles of about four. Um, four classes each. Each class would last like about an hour, an hour and a half. So if you if you see this, we have a, a ton of things we cover. We're basically aspiring to cover um, all, all the curriculum that is out there. So, um, so for example, if uh, I click here in one of these, I want to look at it, I will uh, go into it and First, I have a view where I see all these one, two, three, four. These are the classes, the individual classes. And I can click on an individual class and that will take me to a bunch now, one, two activities. These are moments in the classroom and they have um, guidelines for teachers, okay? So as you can see, this website is not for kids. It's not for students to go in. It's for teachers to download the material. And what you can do is you can uh, click here and say you will get a, uh, a PDF. Okay, I'm gonna open this PDF now. And this PDF is downloadable. And it is indeed for students. So this would be something that you actually give for students. I'm not reading any of this. I'm just showing you the, the look and feel because all this is in Spanish. And it's intended primarily for Argentinian teachers, but it could be as well used for anybody that understands the language. And we're looking forward to translating this, um, this material to other languages. And the other thing, so, so uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, guidelines for, for teachers. There's this downloadable material that can be given directly to students. And in addition to that, you have some videos. So I know that video streams poorly, but for example, 
This is a uh, this is a uh, sequencia. This is a material about and what you can see here is an electroscope that has been rubbed and therefore charged and it attracts the hand of an experimenter and then it can be shown that it attracts a lot of other materials and i will get back to these uh videos so keep it in mind you know make a note i will uh, i will come back to those uh in a moment okay so what are the ideas behind this uh, uh, this website? What's the philosophy? Basically, we we start with this uh, idea that the, the the key things that need to be in the classroom or the key things that characterize science is uh, of, uh, on the one hand nature's phenomena and on the other hand the the the, the ideas that science produces. We conceive science and uh, as this activity that basically seeks to um, explain and predict phenomena. So uh, it's very, um, very important, the connection that is established between the phenomena and the, the, the ideas. And, you know, you all know uh, uh, examples of, of phenomena, objects, organisms, properties, processes, and scientific ideas are all the theories, the laws, the equations, the models that we, uh, we work with all the time. Um, so, for example, a whale, a storm, or two parts colliding, or water freezing, or rusting, or how plants grow would be examples of phenomena that we study as scientists and that, uh, um, and that people are basically exposed to in their lives and students in their educational careers. Now, science produces these ideas to actually uh, explain or predict this phenomenon. And that's how we come, uh, uh, come to natural selection or forces of Newton's law or the idea of atoms. They're all theoretical constructs that allow us to understand nature. But the key is in how to navigate from one to the other. And scientists do that basically creating science. So they explore the question, they make hypotheses, they make predictions, modeling, et cetera. And that process that is the core of the scientific endeavor is basically what is reproduced in, in, in a science classroom. We, if, if, if students or citizens are to understand nature's phenomena scientifically, they need to engage in some form of scientific thinking, also doing exploring questions, hypothesis, predictions, et cetera, et cetera. The key then is to bring the phenomena to the classroom, put them in the center place, but it's not enough just to have a phenomenon because you don't understand it properly. You have to actually dissect it in a scientific way, and that's not easy to do. In fact, it's very hard to do, and scientists, even scientists have a hard time doing it. That's why it's fun. So um, it needs to be done carefully. So these are the key, the three key ingredients that we want to bring to our proposals. Ideas are there, they have to be there. That's what we have to teach. That's the most important thing that we have to do in a classroom. They're maximally important. The problem is, if we only teach ideas, then we fall into an expository. Okay, um, let me tell you about natural selection. I wanna to explain to you natural selection, not necessarily linking it to the phenomena that natural selection seeks to explain. And that's and how it was born on the first place in scientists' hands. In this case, Darwin's. Um, and it, it has a tendency for students to learn by road. So I'm not going to go into ideas. Ideas are very important. And basically, it's what we do all the time, all, although sometimes poorly. Uh, phenomena. We, we should bring phenomena to the classroom. The problem is that not all phenomena are suited to go into a classroom. Obviously, we cannot bring a storm to a classroom. We cannot sequence a genome in the classroom, although maybe one day we'll be able to. Um, so we propose a solution, and that's one of the keys of this uh, um, of this idea of this uh, proposal in Phenomena Autas. We want to propose. Well, I'm going to uh, go back. We propose to use proxies. What are proxies? They are things that stand in the stead of a phenomenon. And it's funny because scientists use proxies all the time. You know, like, for example, a, a, a paleontologist may not analyze a fossil herself. Maybe she gets a camera lucida, a, a, a very precise drawing, or it would have a, a, a mold made and it have a cast of what that fossil is and study scientifically that cast. 
Also, we, it's famous that Watson and Crick resolved the, the DNA double helix the structure with data that was produced by other people. So you don't have to have the data yourself in your hands. You have to, you can handle it in some other way. So we've developed a lot of different phenomenal proxies, tutorials to, for classroom experiments. We, we sometimes offer graphs and data tables, high resolution, high quality images that can be analyzed and videos like the ones I showed you and I told you to remember. We are producing a lot of videos. Here are some pictures of uh, our, uh, our uh, uh, production team filming boring things like water boiling for 20 minutes. The key the, here is that the, the video is made in such a way that students can collect data from it. Say you have water boiling for 20 minutes, there will be a thermometer there and the, 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 the camera will focus on the thermometer in such way that students can make a graph of temperature versus time. So they don't need to do the experiment themselves in the classroom is if they can't, okay, or because they don't have the resources or because they're confined to their houses due to the pandemic. They can perform this experiment remotely and engage with it cognitively as if they were doing it themselves with their own hands. Here in the right hand, you can see uh, our director putting some hairspray on a, a, a globe, an earth globe, because it, sh it was shining too much. And that was, it, was, it, it created funny shimmers. So she was making it more opaque. It has nothing to do with global warming, sorry. Um, so how do we use these, these uh, proxies? Here we have, uh, for example, I'm showing a, a capture from the, uh, from the website. And if we go to one of these classes, I showed you that we have um, all these resources. So this would be, uh, and what I'm pointing out here, it would be uh, the text that the, that the um, students the download to give to the students. And then you would have uh, graphs, for example. So in this, in this, um, in this particular class, where we are analyzing collisions and using cards on a very low uh, friction uh, um, rail, okay, tr and then on a track, and they collide with each other. Um, one of the cars is not moving, the other one is, they stick together, it's an inelastic collision. We produce a graph. So you can use proxies in many ways. You can use the video and use software uh, freely downloadable from the web and actually analyze frame by frame the motion and create your own graphs. Or you can download the graph that we've already created. It's the one that I'm showing here and analyze it mathematically. Say you don't have time, okay, to make all the collisions and everything. Well, another way to engage with phenomena really is through graphs. It's true. It's not the phenomenon itself, but it's close enough so that we can, you can engage cognitively in analyzing what happened. You don't have, I'm not giving you the already uh, digested concept of momentum conservation. I'm going and telling you, if we have a collision, we'll have a graph like this. What can you deduce from this graph? And so the, the, the scientific process still goes on for a student, even though they cannot do the experiment themselves. We have the videos, as I showed you before. And also we have, in this case, a, a folder with the video and all the different types of files that they can use flexibly depending on the decisions that teachers make and how they're going to manage their classroom. How are we doing with time, Eugenia? I was muted, sorry. Um, we have five more minutes in total. So I would say- Five more minutes. Two. Perfect. Maybe three. Plenty, plenty Stop, plenty so, but... We can also have in silver graph, Maybe the, the, the teacher decides that they're going to make the graph themselves, but uh, the, the, she doesn't want them to do all the experiment. But hey, we have a table here of data that was recorded from an actual experiment. So you can use that table. And we use these resources over and over in all our different, uh, um, uh, in the different classes. Now, the key thing, I, I was talking about the ideas, the phenomena, the connection. The connection between the phenomena and the ideas is perhaps the most delicate part of all the process. It's the most, uh, it's the most exciting for scientists and sometimes it could be uh, the most exciting or it could be the most dreadful for a student in a classroom. Uh, it has to be presented in specific ways. A phenomenon just by itself will not speak. 
it, it has to be analyzed in a particular way. For example, if we're going to analyze um, electrostatic interactions, okay, taking off your sweater may give sparks and may put your hair, you know, all, uh, uh, all pointy. That's great, but it doesn't teach you anything really uh, relevant about electrostatics. In order to do that, you may have to construct an electroscope in order to show the key ideas. For example, mm -hmm. the idea that the electrostatic attraction is universal, which is different from the magnetic. And this is something that they need to learn, but they're not going to learn it from a sweater. You have to concoct something. And that's what scientists do all the time in order to yank answers from a certain phenomenon. You have to casually it to do it. You have to, you have to make it experimental. You have to bring it to a lab. Uh, uh, streamline it, idealize it, simplify it. All those things need to be done in the classroom as well. And on top of that, so this is one thing that needs to be done. And the other thing that needs to be done is need to be uh, um, carefully guided. And that's something that uh, um, um, teachers do very well. So for example, in one of these uh, activities on DNA, what we, what we got is the first analyze the text the very text that was published in Nature by Watson and Crick when they they uh, uh, they communicated the, the they had solved the, the the DNA structure and so for example here uh, there's an activity where they they are presented with the percentages of the of, of one of the nucleotides adenosine in uh, uh, and it's one of the results that Erwin Chargaff uh, had so they're analyzing the data of of, of Chargaff. And uh, they're, they're asked to fill the rest of the table. It's a simple exercise. And instead of telling them, it's just always the same amount of A and T, whatever. OK, they have to tread through it. They have to think about it. And this is an exercise to do so. So this is an example of how you guide students to make the connection between the actual raw data, the phenomena, and the ideas that we want to, to, uh, for them to learn. This is another example, in, in, in this case, using high resolution, uh, uh, um, high quality, uh, in this case, ultrastructure of the cell. And what we ask them to do is very simple. We want to, 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 for them to realize the eukaryotic cell has internal compartments. And what they ask them to do is color, you know, make, uh, grab pencils and, uh, and, and assign different colors to the inside and the outside of a certain structure. For example, how many compartments can you see here? You know, color them. And we're not interested in you know, the Golgi apparatus at all. First, we're, we're trying to detect the compartments. So that's the proper question to make. So to, to, to summarize this, uh, we are putting all our effort into uh, uh, making meaningful the connection between phenomena and ideas. And that connection can only be made meaningful through a very careful uh, work that has to be done by scientists and educators. They need to collaborate on that. And we have ongoing collaborations between scientists and educators to do that because they are the, are, the educators are the ones that can identify best the ways to guide concept development based on phenomena. Uh, uh, you'd be surprised, and sometimes, sometimes scientists have an intuition on how to do it, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they know their stuff and they want to deliver it right away. But scientists are key to understand what are the phenomena behind the idea. Sometimes teachers don't know, they, they, they haven't been taught or they, 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 they glossed over uh, the concepts and they don't know what's the evidence behind all the ideas that we've constructed. And so it's through these partnerships that we can actually dissect for each important idea in the curriculum, what are the key phenomena that had to be there, in which order, and how to conduct the process of discovery in students to go smoothly and robustly from phenomena to ideas, and sometimes from ideas to phenomena as well. And I think this is uh, uh, the end of the presentation. We are a lot of people here. Uh, I want to mention Rosalina Casarini and Pablo Salomon specifically, and Alejandra Candia from the foundation. This was a collaboration between two uh, civil society uh, entities, uh, an NGO, Expedición Ciencia, and uh, a foundation. And it, it was a very, very fruitful um, gathering of minds. And Expedition Ciencia has been working for 20 years uh, uh, putting together um, scientists and, and educators to work to solve educational problems. 
and this is just another um, uh, another very ambitious uh, um, project. We hope to have uh, resources for all subjects for all education um, in about less than a year. I think I'm on time, Eugenia. I don't know, and I, I guess I have. I, I will take questions, right? If yes. I can answer. Um, so two Thank things. Thank you I so said. very much uh, for, for having. Me. Thank you very much. So two things I wanted to say before um, giving space for questions. The first one was a question that was already asked in the chat. That was about languages. Uh, that was so we are currently starting to uh, work with phenomenautas in order in part also in order to help them reach um, other languages in other countries, but also um, in order to invite our scientists to actively engage in um, participating in the activities of Phenomenautas by means of contributing to their uh, sequences and giving um, also their expertise in reviewing the existing ones and proposing new ones. So, uh, if you have any questions, there's two ways to ask them. One is in the chat and the other, there's a Q&A also that at the bottom of your screen, you will see the option of Q&A. Um, you can leave them written there and you can have Gabriel answering or if Gabriel wants to answer in uh, out loud, we can do that at the end of the presentation. For now, I uh, would invite Barbara maybe to try to present her project. Okay. Perfect. We can hear you. Do you want to try to share your screen again? Okay. Otherwise, I can share it for you. Can you see it? Yes. And we can, can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Hey, that's great. So let's start again. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Barbara Calderani. I'm a high school science teacher in Reggio Emilia, Northern Italy. I teach at IESES European High School, a school that is highly innovative in its teaching method. I got into STEM world thanks to the innovative personality of my school. Uh, in fact, we apply in everyday lessons the active learning method and integrate it with new technologies. A few years ago, I took a path in STEM through international courses and workshops, which enlightened me on this subject and helped me train as a STEM teacher from ESA, ESA education workshops and online courses to Airbus Foundation Discovery Space MOOCs and courses and only online courses. Also, Scientix provided me with exceptional training courses and a lot of material to apply the STEM method to my lessons. Scientix is the community for science education in Europe. It promotes and supports a Europe-wide collaboration among STEM teachers, education researchers, policymakers, and other STEM education professionals. This year, I became an ambassador for Scientix with the aim of spreading STEM internationally. I'm here now to briefly explain the principles of our STEM method. As I said before, Scientix provides lots of materials, online materials for STEM lessons, training courses, webinars, and workshops. It's coordinated by European Schoolnet, and the main stakeholders of Scientix are teachers, researchers, and project managers in STEM education. Here are some links that I think would be useful for your STEM lessons. For example, to find teachers and schools to collaborate with in STEM projects or to showcase projects in the Scientix project library or to link your teaching and learning materials to the Scientix resource repository. I would like to point out two MOOCs very, very useful for STEM training. The first one is Integrated STEM Teaching for Secondary Schools MOOC, co-founded by the STEMIT project and the Scientix project. The course was organized alongside another course for primary teachers, namely Integrated STEM Teaching for Primary Schools. Due to popular demand, both MOOCs will be coming back in October 2021 for another round. They were held last year first. Another MOOC very useful could be STEM is Everywhere Rerun, organized by Scientix. All the materials are, um, you can find all the materials on the Scientix website. 
So what is STEAM education? STEAM education is recognized as a priority in Europe by public and educational authorities. It's an effort to combine all the four disciplines of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, as well as non-science classes. In fact, the, the A in the word STEAM stands for all. All the other subjects, such as literature, history, economics, language classes, and so on into one class, one unit, or one lesson that is based on connections between the subjects and real world problems, led to the idea of an integrated STEAM teaching. So what is STEAM education? STEAM education uh, is the first integrated education framework in Europe, led by STEAMIT project. Co-founded by the Rasmus Plus program. Sorry, I okay, this one. Um, Co-founded by Rasmus Plus program of the European Union, who collect ministries of education, industry, and STEM teachers in a STEAM education co-construction process. Today, in general, in Europe, in secondary education, STEM disciplines continue to be taught in an isolated way. There are no STEM classes in general, there are S classes. T classes, E classes, and classes, and not even the S is one. Uh, there are physics classes, chemistry classes, biology classes, and so on. In order to really get students to see the interest in STEM degrees and careers, and even more importantly, show students and society at large the key role that STEM plays in improving our lives and their need for our future, we need STEM to be taught in an integrated way. We need all the letters in STEM to work together, and even better, for all the subjects to work together. We need to apply measures to teach the different disciplines in an integrated way, connected to real-life issues and to the 21st century skills. 21st century skills can be applied in all academic subject areas and in all educational, career, and civic, civic, civic settings throughout the student's life. Integrated STEM teaching aims to enhance 21st century skills in students. So let's have a STEM overview. By integrating more than one STEM subject, we encourage the use of pedagogical methods such as inquiry-based learning, IBSE, or project-based learning and prompt students to work collaboratively. The use of hands-on activities, namely do-it-yourself activities and the respective resources is required, but most importantly, teachers need to be make good use of the resources they have among them and work with their colleagues. The collaboration between teachers in different STEM disciplines is a positive factor to make your work effective. Integrated technology um, and science provides opportunities to increase interest in students, especially if they are exposed to scientific investigation. In fact, scientific inquiry and design-based thinking, underlying problem solving and decision-making processes across science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So inquiry-based science education is the base of STEM teaching because students work on actual solutions to problems or questions by conducting investigation and demonstrate their theories. They question every principle they have been taught and tested in activities that take place in class or in lab. In teaching IBSE, Workshops are an integral part of the course, which is focused on students' learning rather than on teacher speeches. Understanding science is much more important than knowing facts. Effective learning requires students to be aware of and to be responsible for their learning. The IBSE method encourages personal thinking, questioning, peer discussion and debate. Students work in groups ask questions, make observations and experiments, collect data and try to interpret them, formulate hypotheses and draw conclusions on the basis of their data. Well, the following scheme, which was proposed in 1989 by Bybee, summarizes IBSE theory and the 5E instructional method. This experiential learning cycle applies both to learners and teachers. 
were able to understand effectively IBSE method only by practicing it in class. It consists of questions, experience, and reflections on the results obtained from experiences. The most important feature is, uh, is that the explored step precedes the explained one, exact, exactly the opposite of traditional teaching and learning. In the engaged phase, teachers in, the teacher introduces the topic that will be covered in the next lesson. So students' mind begin to be, to be engaged in the new topic. A uh, teacher must be able to create a sense of mystery, stimulating curiosity, willingness to uncover knowledge and skills, or to build them, generating new questions, involving students on a personal level, inducing them to confront their previous knowledge. This is reached through short-term activities, very simple activities, which create an unexpected or at least uncertain ending. They insinuate doubt in students. In this phase, they are not told any form of law or formula. In no way is the conclusion of the case revealed. In the explore phase, students explore the phenomena or models they have studied, they are studying through practical activities using their cognitive background. The aim is to ask new questions and generate autonomous explanations by integrating the collected data with their own analysis. And teacher introduces scientific backgrounds and specific vocabularies to contextualize the experience and make it more realistic. Teacher now is a guide during the whole experience. In the explained phase, students provide their own explanations of the phenomena for which they have collected data in the explore phase. The explanations are compared with those of the peers. Explanations can, be, uh, can also be challenged by peer comparison. In the elaborate phase, the so-called extend phase, students apply generalizations of new learning to previous investigation. Hypotheses are tested through real life scenarios. In doing so, they lay the foundation of an authentic knowledge, experienced and really understood, sealed by the cognitive framework provided by the teacher. In the evaluate phase, students are able to self-evaluate their acquired competencies through targeted assessments, for example, through peer-to-peer -peer reviewed training tests. They prove what they have come to know in writing, demonstration activities and conversations, and the teacher can gradually see their progress. So here you can see a QKWL chart. Uh, it can be used for all subjects in a whole group, a small group. This is a comprehension strategy used to activate background knowledge prior to practicing activity and it is completely student-centered. Teacher can use a version of this chart to evaluate students as well. So how does the teacher role change during an IBSE learning process? The teacher shifts from a dispenser of knowledge to a supporter, a coach of students learning he asks meaningful questions, namely open-ended questions. He creates learning scenarios to get students into real situations where they can face critical issues. He helps students construct their knowledge. He gives formative assessments that focus on experimental data, support students in reaching their learning goals, and monitor their progress. For example, some, um, some examples of open-ended teaching question may be uh, how new technologies have improved our lives. Do you think we can live without plastic? Students can choose how to answer, how they want to approach the problem in order to solve it. This would be a very, a very personal approach. So what skills students develop? Of course, critical thinking, collaborative skills, peer-to-peer -peer discussion, self-evaluation, use of their knowledge to find new answers, problem solving in critical case studies, connections between theory and real world, and awareness of science process. Another important aspect of STEM method is SBL, scenario-based learning. Scenario-based learning is an immersive training environment created by the teacher where learners meet realistic work challenges and get realistic feedback as they progress, since everything that happens reflects the learner's choices. 
Learners don't absorb information passively by reading a text or taking a test afterward. In scenario-based training, they actively participate in the process from the very beginning to the end of the lesson. So SBL is especially useful when a decision made at a certain point affects how things go later. When a test requires analysis and problem solving skills, when there is no single correct solution to the problem, and when it's difficult for the teacher to provide real world practice. Also, PBL is an important aspect of STEM method, project based learning. It is a student centered approach that builds teaching and learning around projects. But what is a project? A project is a complex test based on real life problems, challenging questions that enhance students' problem solving, design, decision making, and inquiry skills. At the end of their pathway, students are able to produce something tangible or a map or a presentation of the work. Projects uh, must be central, not peripheral to the curriculum. Projects involve two or more subjects. Projects has to be have to be realistic, not school-like. Also, problem solving till and tinkering are important strategies. Uh, of the STEM method. The problem solving is a complex competence developed with a highly organized collaborative methodology in terms of roles and strategic vision, which aims to place students in a problematic situation to identify a possible solution. And finally, to verify the effectiveness of the solution by diagnosing the error, students must learn to make mistakes and to face wrong conclusions first in order to start again from the starting point. Tinkering is referred to a form of learning in which you learn by doing. All activities must be carried out in groups and consist of constructing or decomposing objects, designing moving machines, exploring materials or mechanical elements, creating original artifacts or chain reactions and so on. TL stands for Technology Enhanced Active Learning. It's a methodology that combines theoretical learning, lab activities, and technology to create and enrich a collaborative learning that stimulates peer-to-peer -peer discussion, networking, synthesis of issues, and so on. Well, what is CLEAL? Why is CLEAL so important in STEM? CLEAL stands for Content and Language Integrated Learning. So curriculum subjects ranging from humanities to STEM can be taught in a foreign language. That's really, really important. CLIL is based on active, interactive, and dynamic activities, learning experience in the lab or during your class or workshops, experiential learning, peer-to-peer -peer work and cooperation and group work. All these strategies are techniques and techniques are perfectly in line with STEM teaching. So integrating a foreign language in a STEM activity or in a lesson plan is a good way to shift from the STEM method, STEM word, to STEAM word. So the non-STEM subject, the A in the word STEAM, could be represented by CLIL. That's a good strategy. That's a good, maybe a good solution. Well, that's all. I hope you enjoyed this journey into STEM. Hope you will find all the information provided useful to build easy and um, creative and interesting STEM lessons. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, if there's any questions for Barbara, again, you can use both the chat and the Q&A. In any case, um, I was thinking maybe to group uh, the at the end of the, of the last talk, which will start by Pankaj now, um, we can do a, a bit of a, like 15 minute uh, Q and A, general Q and A, in which we can discuss. Maybe even the panelists can discuss among themselves uh, what are the things that they see in each other's presentations, which would also be really nice to have a sort of roundtable. Um, so right now, I'm going to introduce our last speaker, which is Pankaj Hein. Maybe I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, so he. He is uh, a scientist, he was uh, studying biophysics and then neuroscience. And then he started 
well, he started an initiative in, uh, in India that is called Seed to Sapling Education. That is also a really nice practical way to teaching science. And I think now he's going to tell us a bit more about that. So you have the floor. Right. Um, thank you, Eugenia, and thank you, Levi Bo, Lectures Without Border Community, uh, for this one more uh, invitation for this event. I'm quite excited because the name is STEM. Uh, many times, at least in Indian context, I don't know about the uh, rest of the world, but STEM is generally associated with robotics, a lot of technology. The S and M are not given much importance, and uh, I'm great that. Uh, the previous two speakers gave a lot of focus on S and M also, which is what uh, forms the core of STEM, although they are uh, in the spelling there at the site. So um, thank you for that. I'll quickly take everyone through an experience, which is my favorite thing to do for any of these sessions. So like last time, we will have one more thing, but a different one this time. So uh, you are all free to uh, participate through the chat box. Uh, I have this arrow over here. I mean, I have another arrow with me over here. And how will this arrow look like if I see through this container? You see this, this is an empty container. So how will this arrow look like through this empty container? Right? Yeah, you are all free to uh, make your predictions. You all have right to be wrong. Uh, this is one of the important things that we give all the teachers and students and everyone in life because we make mistakes and we learn from it and yeah, we build a lot of um, wisdom, knowledge, everything. So many people are saying uh, mirror image, curved, reversed, just a bit warped. Okay, so let's see how will this look like. Okay, so I'll do one thing. I'll just stop sharing my screen. Uh, sorry, yeah, and uh, if you can just spotlight or pin me so that everybody sees it. This is an empty thing. And you see, there's no inversion, no reversal, no mirror image, nothing. All right. Now, what will happen if I just pour some water into it? There's some water into it. Right? Now, what will happen? Normally, if the jar is empty, reversed if filled with water. Okay. Okay, so now it becomes like a lens. Let's see. Oh, nice. Can you see? Right. Now, the question is, what will happen if I see it like this? So all this while I was seeing it like this, vertical position. Now, what will happen if I see it through a horizontal container? Now, what are your guesses? A horizontal container. Will it be reversed even now or it will be normal or something else? And what is that something else? Ah. Nice, upside down. Okay. See, yes, colors inversed, isn't it? So we got quick answers. And these are all using very simple things, right? There's a paper, there's a container, and that's about it. So we don't need a lens kind of thing for all these experiments. All we required was one container, which we can do it through normal glass. Now my question is this, how will the arrow look like if I see through this bottle, which is, uh, if you see the shape of this bottle, there is, a curvature over here. And obviously it's a, a cylindrical kind of bottle. So there is this curvature. Now, how will it look like? How will it look like through this bottle? Yes, quick guesses again. Inverse, no inverse. And then there is this part also. So where there is this other kind of lens. So we have both convex and concave over here. So flipped, flipped, as in which flipped? Will it be this flip or this flip? Or both the flip? Yes, quick, quick, quick. 
left right okay so we can use this notation left right up down or horizontal vert vertical okay so left right horizontal okay vertical okay so let's see see we have two arrows one in the bulge one in the groove so see in the bulge it is inverted both the ways there is color inversion you can see the pink down the blue up the arrow is pointing in the reverse direction whereas this one is just the um right depending on where right yes so just see in this curvature over here right so so the idea is we are just using very very simple things these are just bottles available everywhere and these are containers available everywhere these are things available everywhere uh and then there are these bottles which are available everywhere so another interesting thing which i have right now is this glass of water there is cold water inside and you see all these water droplets appearing outside right from where are these water droplets appearing we can't sir again from where are these water droplets appearing ah oh, air condensed easy okay so i'll just come to this air condensed in a while so we just saw some of these things uh, i guess uh, eugenia if you remember we did this other thing in the last session um, so as we i mean generally we start with observation questions lot of interesting observations come from students much more open ended but in interest of time i'll uh, close it down to a single question that the water stream is getting narrower now how many times we wash our hands every day and have we been observant about this stream of water and next time and next time and next time and every time when you all wash the water, uh, wash your hands next time and we do it so frequently these days uh, just be a bit more observant about the stream of water and just see this stream keeps getting narrow and narrow and narrow why is that so and uh, uh, how can we prove it experimentally uh, whatever the reason is whatever our initial hypothesis is and design an experiment so what may be the reason for this stream getting narrower any quick guesses now speed of water is increasing okay any other reasons increase the speed of stream all right so two similar guesses so how will the speed uh, uh, lead to narrowing of the stream and how do you prove it experimentally how do you prove it experimentally can we design some quick experiment to uh, show this is or just check whether what we are hypothesizing is fine or not so fine let's say i see bubbles at the top okay so somebody says there is less air so there is bubbles over here and there is no bubble so it is because of some air which just gets out of this water stream all right so uh, so more speed of the water means more uh i guess compression of the air all right okay so we will not go into surface tension high pressure all right so lot of reasons the thing is how can we uh, um check our hypothesis experimentally whether what we are thinking is right or wrong um so that is the idea now i'll quickly go to our class of water again and uh, i will leave this uh topic also hanging like the hanging pressure so we will just see if there is time permitting after the entire session gets over till then we will just focus on all the other thing that i want to uh, share with you so i have this glass of cold water and as some of you rightly told that there is air condensation but any case is what will a child think of who has no idea about air condensation and temperature differences and all these other things what will a child think of when they see these water droplets appearing outside a glass of cold water any guesses now this is like 8 years 10 years old children water is cold okay so there was no water initially and suddenly in 2 3 minutes time there is lot of water outside go through the glass now what should we do as facilitators what can we do as facilitators this is what precisely most of the children in our experience or not most actually all the children in our experience have thought Uh, and that is like running in thousands of students so this has been tried on at least more than 1000 students and 
everybody seemed to be thinking that it is through the glass and not just the kids many of the adults also who forget the scientific concepts in the school so they think that it is coming through the glass so what do we do next this is what uh, precisely most of the student think what do we do next they say it is going through the glass now there is a chapter i want to teach condensation and this is the answer i get from the students what next yes can you make it without water okay any 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 other thoughts what else can we do let's have a lot of diverse responses what all things we can do this is something which i guess everybody can relate to condensation is a very uh, natural thing that comes to most of us because of our knowledge cold alcohol in it or any empty glass try with warm water drink that water okay so uh, so we are trying to tell them something or trying to come up with some counter uh, uh, okay so the question is i ask the students from where are these water droplets appearing they say that it is coming through the glass uh, so if they are saying coming through the glass what can we do as facilitators as science facilitators what or stem facilitators how can we respond to that uh, answer of the child so weigh the glass before and after so basically we are all coming up with some experiments uh, which is like countering their understanding but can we ask them to prove their hypothesis so this is what their hypothesis is instead of so and this is the reason so this is how it is coming from inside to outside so uh, normal water doesn't come but cold water can come probably they convert into some gas and then it comes outside or it evaporates and then comes and settles back uh, near the water so instead of doing any or sharing any counter examples sharing any can counter examples with the students we just ask them to prove your hypothesis this is what you are saying fair enough uh, i don't want to uh, do any debate with you or counter your thought process can you design some experiment to check whether that works that way or something else and these are actually the experiments of the students so this guy who said that uh, it is evaporating and coming here this guy just closed it with the lid and he saw that oh the water is still coming outside so something wrong with my hypothesis so being self critical we are talking about critical thinking problem solving skills lot of other skills now they are continuously doing this process where they are not just uh, as a class being critical of each other but also being self critical somebody tried with a uh, uh, colored ice again it works the same way there is transparent water outside somebody tried to tape it off again you see water outside so at least at the first step they are saying that okay so it probably is not coming from inside to outside maybe there is some other mechanism to come from inside to outside not this or it is coming from somewhere else so at least first step is done now what next can be done we will see later on but uh, so this is precisely what we do as a group uh, we try to create this nice experiential enriched a very joyful learning environment for the child not just for science math but generally in the school so they look forward to learning in the school and at the same time there is also important to give focus on the process of each subject because each process has its own beauty so each subject has its own beauty so if they can taste that beauty uh, so the idea is instead of they consuming knowledge they also somewhere recreate the knowledge or create sometimes new knowledge and we have had some examples like the formulas which the students came up with i have one very classic things uh, divisibility test of 11 now the students came up with a formula which even the teachers were not aware of and teachers were wondering okay it seems to be working but what is the mathematical logic behind it they got it to us and then we had to really work out okay why is it working the formula was also working perfectly fine so we get some of times these new kind of solutions also which we also don't anticipate right so there is this um, high heart sum component so lot of interest component very strong interest component um, and if we can relate it to some examples or challenges which the students can relate to all the time and uh, they feel hooked to it they feel very interested to know more about those phenomena or some challenges that they want to 
uh, solve. And then there is a lot of inquiry all the time. It is just um, full of inquiry. Um, we try to get the questions also from the students so that there is much more ownership component instead of just the interest. Form. So they own, try to own that, okay, I want to find out the answer first. So now I want to learn instead of somebody else teaching me. And then there is definitely hands-on component, but again, hands-on is no instructions given, no experiments design shared. They try to come up with their own thing. A lot of time they fail, but as a group, say there are 10 groups in a class, at least one or two will get the right kind of solution, but there is so much of learning that happens from the wrong solutions. So that's where they also realize that, okay, it's okay to make mistakes even in life as general, but let's not go into that philosophy much. But at the same time for learning that helps a lot. Okay, so this is the, what the focus is, a lot of skills, uh, not much on the lower levels of the Bloom's taxonomy, but like if they can create knowledge, a lot of data is presented or they are collecting their own data so if they can analyze it and make sense of it. So, and at the same time, so there is a lot of focus on all these different types of skills. And as we see, like over a year, we can see the change in their attitude itself over time. So we have seen like sometimes during these exhibitions, this to the visitors, they ask these kind of questions and the visitors are hesitant to answer. It's okay, sir, you can, you have right to be wrong. You can make um, your own guesses, no, don't worry. So that also leads to some change of attitude over time, right? So these are the different things that we work with. So we mainly work with teachers. So there's a lot of handholding in their capacity building things. So it's not like some one-off kind of workshop. These are spread out throughout the year or two years or three years. So we try to take the teachers through this process, try to empower them. And once they taste this beauty, they enjoy it, wow. Oh, this is what science and maths is, or this is what my subject is. I want to uh, give my students the same thing. I want to take them through this same journey, such a joyful thing. So, and that works quite, I mean, just working amazingly well, where the teachers now say that, okay, please share some more ideas, or uh, this is what I observed in my kitchen. Can we use this thing for this kind of concept? Or I don't know what, what exactly is the thing, because one fine day my rice turned yellow in, uh, sorry, red in color. So just trying to make probably some uh, added lot of, um, what do you call, curcumin, this turmeric, and probably use some base. So they, those became red rice. So the teachers are asking, okay, I don't know why my rice became red in color. Okay, so, so teachers also start becoming more observant at the same time, then they take the same thing through to the students. We also work with students so that we also try to get a lot of things. What do the students think? Because in our wildest imagination, we can't think what the child thinks. So we try to get a lot of these things from the teachers, uh, students directly also. So there are a lot of these long-term engagements that happen with the teachers. And again, the focus as discussed, it is more on the scientific or mathematical process skills. And, and yeah, they also become more reflective teachers. So they try to reflect on their own classroom experiences, um, come up with their own ideas. At the same time, we can discuss some other ideas from our side and see how they can connect science math to the real world. And then there are these other programs where there is much more intervention with the teachers, some material, simple, simple material shared, not much fanciful things. Mostly it's very simple, simple things. So this is the roadmap which we try to take the teachers through and starting from building on questions or some answers that the students give, see how we can work on the different skills and then make the students thinking visible, generate new teaching ideas. And at the same time, assessing the skills. Uh, so be it about formative or summative assessment processes. So how can we uh, really use this learning process itself for our assessments? Uh, and that's where we can also intervene better in our next classes. So if we see, then there is nice um, increase in curiosity or observation or thinking for the teachers themselves. So once this happens, automatically I'll show the students parameters also. So once this happens in the teachers, and obviously, because they want to do it in their own class, they say that, okay, I've started asking more questions or I've given slightly more time for the students to think. So instead of immediately giving the answer, maybe half a minute or two minutes, or sometimes keeping it on hold till the next period. So that also helps a lot. So the teachers also are showing a lot of interest. Uh, and then automatically these things work for the students also and using very simple basic materials which are available around. So students also enjoy do it, designing a lot of these things and then going wrong and learning from all these different things. And in the online world, we have used a lot of these other tools which have worked quite well. And as we can see, obviously this is expected because the teachers themselves are becoming much more curious or 
experimentative. So this is the change is also seen in the students automatically. So yeah, the other thing is like what determines the pedagogy that the teacher use. So sometimes it is like the understanding or appreciation that pedagogy for the teacher themselves, intrinsic factor. And similarly, what is my belief of that subject? Like when we ask sometimes the teachers, what is science or what is math? So they end up saying that it is a lot of knowledge which scientists have given us, or it is a lot of formulas which mathematicians have worked out. But very few times we get to know that science is that process to go from unknown to known, or that journey, or mathematics is um, finding out different patterns and making sense of all those things around us. So it is not about knowing what somebody else has given us, but uh, going on this journey. So we try to address it to, for the teachers. And once that is done, automatically those things are taken care of. But many times the teachers also have a lot of other external factors which are not in their control, like say time, or there are a lot of vast syllabus to complete, or the assessment pattern is not aligned to the pedagogy. So if we try to work with the schools and see if we can help the teachers to address these external factors also. And that has worked quite well. So uh, school, teacher, parents, all these uh, stakeholders, once everybody is aligned, then automatically the students uh, really enjoy this process of learning. So this is what we do. And yeah, this is what we work as a team. So mostly from research background, but a lot of passion to uh, be with students. So it's not like we wanted to make a change in the education system, but it was like we are learning or we are enjoying this process of taking the teachers or students through this process. So because of our in, uh, innate joy that we derive being with kids, this is what we are trying to do with schools. Um, yeah, um, we'll not take some any other experiences. I've already overshooted time. So these are the different kind of things we do. And it was great sh sharing all these different uh, initiatives and ideas and experiments and whatnot with all of you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.